Hello, it's Jack Tudor here from Attention Magazine. Welcome to Crucial Listening, the podcast where I speak with experimental musicians and sound artists about three albums that are important to them. My guest this time is Mark Fell, a musician who manipulates the textures that one may associate with dance music of various forms and turns them into these strange facets of sculpture, really. If you've ever listened to Mark's work on headphones, it's a really strange experience. The way that sounds sit inside your head feels very tactile. It's like someone plucking the skin on your head or tapping on your skull. And live as well. His music is amazing. His, the way he works with rhythm is unreal. I mean, a lot of his stuff seems to involve placing rhythm in dialogue with something, whether it's the subtle manipulation of a particular digital synthesizer or whether it's the live collaborations that he's taken to doing where he feeds a rhythmic pattern into the earphones of an improviser and charges them with the task of keeping pace with this rhythm as it transforms. We talk about that a little bit in the conversation. And we also talk about the three albums that Mark picked out, all of which I really enjoyed listening to. And if you are not familiar with Mark's work already, head over to markfell.com and have a peruse. He's great. And obviously you can go to attentionmagazine.co.uk forward slash crucial listening for more information on Mark's picks and links to Mark's work as well. So here it is, Mark Fell on Crucial Listening. Hello, Mark. Welcome to Crucial Listening. Hello. So you've just, in the last couple of days, come back from Greece, Mark, is that right? Yeah, I was in Crete at uh, some festival in uh, a little old town there. I can't remember, even remember the name of the town. Chania or something like that. I'm probably saying it wrong. <laughs> and it was in a, in, a, in a shop that hired bikes out for tourists, and because it was off-season there's no one around so basically they just decide to do music events so i did that <laughs> wow yeah 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 it was pretty good actually it was it was good fun good crowd and uh, yeah and a nice place to be for a few days and you were playing multi stability is that right they asked me to do that yeah which is actually i think that's like about 8 or 9 years old now <laughs> <laughs> Maybe seven years old. And I, I, I kind of keep a tally of how many times I've played it, and that was the 81st time that I'd played it live. Um, so it's, it's kind of quite weird doing something that many times. But it's kind of nice as well that I've kept it like that, and it's something that if someone wants me to play, then I can just play it. And it, it the system was is exactly as it was when I first did it a long time ago. So I, I've seen as well that you've maybe, I don't know how seriously you were saying this, but perhaps you'll stop at 100. So you're not that far off now. Yeah, I, I might stop at 100 or maybe 10 years, like once it gets to a 10 year, 10th anniversary or something, but whatever comes first. But yeah, maybe I'll limit it at 100, 100 performances. Are you getting something different out of those performances now? I mean, you mentioned that you were playing in a bike shop. I mean... <laughs> Have you been able to observe like what happens when you place this piece within strange locations or different spaces, you know, in amongst different audiences? What's that been like? Yeah, I mean, one of the things when I first... So I'm not from a musical background in terms of... I, I never studied music or learned any musical instruments, so the whole idea of performance is something that's completely alien to me, really. Hmm. So it took me a while to um, to kind of understand what the relationship with the audience could be and f 
When I first started doing shows, it seemed that whatever I did didn't fit in any context. But the weird thing about this show is, the multi-stability thing, it seems to kind of fit wherever you do it. So if I do it in a gallery, it kind of works, or in a club, it can work, or in a bike shop, or... <laughs> you know, it's kind of weird that it seems to fit sort of okay wherever I do it. And, you know, if it's a seated audience, they'll all sit there scratching the chins and stuff and enjoy it. <laughs> or if it's a kind of techno club... You, sometimes there's a bunch of people kind of get into it and start dancing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, most of the time when I'm performing, I'm actually concentrating on what I'm doing, so I don't really... You ca I kind of intuitively sort of know that what the audience is f sort of, how they're responding. You know, you can tell when an audience is just not there and hmm. uh, in terms of not engaged with what you're doing or if they're into it. So... Um, but yeah, it seems to work in a few different ways, so that's quite good, I think. Is there, in terms of how you're producing this music um, and the mechanics of the system, I mean, are there many moving parts so that if you feel an inclination grab you in the moment? I, I know I've seen you say that, you know, say, for example, compared to the recorded version, you've been extending certain sections, and by the sounds of it, well, like... yeah, so what it is is basically a bunch of quite simple ways of generating patterns that have got parameters that change the whatever comes out the other end um, and so in terms of how that works live then y y there's a kind of preset path that I know I can kind of wander down and it will be alright but then what I often do is like sometimes think oh yeah I feel kind of confident enough on this occasion just to twiddle this a little bit and see where that goes so it's not like anything is possible yeah but it's not like it's a pre it's totally preset and there's a clear route every time do you know what i mean it's like and some bits i kind of still think i still kind of get a little bit lost in like combinations of parameters and stuff if you know what i mean in li um, in in like a um i don't know a sequencing sense or or in yeah because there might be like three or four parameters that that combine to generate the particular pattern mm. and and y you can kind of quite easily not get the right set of the right combination or just find something new that you'd previously not thought of yeah well nice there's still 19 yeah, more yeah. performances of you know potential yeah yeah in the... well, uh, <laughs> yeah yeah let's see if someone's happy to pay for me to do it <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I just wanted to mention as well, I see that you're also performing a piece called Intra on those microtonal metallophones as well. Um, yeah. That looks really interesting. I mean, am I right in saying it sounds like it's been performed once back in November? Has it been performed since yet? No, it's just, it was performed just once at, mm. at the premiere of it when I did a show at Sir Alva's in Porto. And... Um, yeah, they commissioned it, so I went over there not knowing exactly how it would turn out uh, and spent like three or four days with this group of musicians trying things. Um, so essentially it's like four people playing these metallophones that were designed by Xenarchist, so they, they kind of look identical, but the pitch of the tuning of each note is kind of slightly uh, off, so if everyone played the same note, you'd get a kind of... Uh, a kind of diff there'd be some kind of difference in terms of the pitch that there were the frequencies that were present, and what happens is that each of the four performers wear headphones, and I kind of generate these patterns that they follow, and then there's a few rules about what they're meant to do when, sort of, in terms of do two of these and then one of these and two of the sort of. Yeah, I've heard about you using that technique or something similar, at least by the sounds of it, with. People like Ok Young Lee and Laura yeah. Cannell and stuff like that. It sounds um, it sounds fascinating. I, I really want to see one of those performances, but it also sounds so stressful for yeah. whoever you're putting in that position. Yeah, well, when I kind of first started doing it, the first time I did it was in 2011 with a Swedish drummer whose name I forgot, Patrick something or other. And um, I kind of realised that... So I was doing this stuff where the... It's basically a list of durations. So if you change one duration, then the whole loop either extends or contracts, if you know what I mean. Mm. And I realised that doing this was really difficult for people. It, it made it really difficult for people to follow. And I kind of really enjoyed the bits when these very highly trained performers 
struggled and did things that indicate they couldn't really follow what was happening, if you know what I mean. Yes. So it's kind of a nice way of just getting away from this idea of perfect performance or, um, you know, just the kind of blips and sort of disruptive bits in the middle of a something that would otherwise be quite slick and well presented was kind of like, for me, a really nice sort of idea, if you know what I mean. Not, not, it's not really about failure as such, but more about kind of uh, the limits of what it's like to struggle to kind of cope with something, if you know what I mean. So that's kind of what I sort of like about it. That it's just kind of beyond the ability, the musical ability of the performer to follow, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I mean, I've listened to a couple of clips of some of the pieces from that tape you did on the tape one. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got a little teaser of what that was like, but it sounds like you get the whole spectrum of alignment and feeling comfortable and then suddenly having things rip from under you and then recalibration and it's it, yeah i guess yeah it sounds you know, to hear i mean as as i think you kind of mentioned there someone like i don't know laura cannell who's so masterful and has such mm-hmm. a beautiful way with her instrument to mm. suddenly be <laughs> pedaling faster to keep up with this yeah. rhythm but it's, it's not like it's not like i mean i say to them it's not like you can do anything wrong so yeah you know, don't feel bad or something yeah but um like when ok young did it at cafe otto i think she said it was the most stressful performance she'd ever done yeah. in her life or something like <laughs> that that she thought she was going to die or something by the end of it, <laughs> it does. which is not, not a very nice <laughs> thing to do i guess <laughs> so i just kind of apologized to her it, it's <laughs> kind of does sound like one of those experiments where they have you know, words in a colour, but then with a different yeah, colour. Yeah. It, <laughs> it is, I guess it is like that. It's just the limits of human cognition. And uh, not that it's anything particularly complicated, but he, the kind of timing systems in someone's brain, I guess, work in a certain way. And, and that's, I guess, the way, the reason why music is the way it is. Hmm. And the, the rhythms I'm making for that stuff don't sort of follow that um convention but but the thing i did with the guys in porto is a little bit different in that the patterns are always kind of stable oh right so they know they know what they are and they've rehearsed them for like four or five days so it's not like there are any clear mistakes if you know what i mean yeah and where's that going to be performed in april that is at bologna live arts week great uh in some gallery there i don't i don't know what it is yeah okay well let's talk about some albums mark i mean you've been kind enough to select three albums and that you deem to be important i actually Mm. in my research for this i found a article on your own website called dawn of man where it sounded like you'd potentially i mean it depends how you thought about importance i suppose but i guess there could be seen to be some likeness in the two tasks although it sounded like it was a difficult task to whittle that one down to you yeah, know, 10 or 12 yeah. tracks. So how did you find the experience of distilling to three records that you considered to be important? Was that more difficult or easier? Or? Well, the Dawn of Man thing, that was when this musicologist Georgina Bourne, I think she's based at Oxford now, was doing a project on um, the history of electronic music. And she just asked me to... Uh, do a playlist of like you know a few things and I found that I couldn't do it so it really went like kept going you know just expanding in all directions this long list of stuff that I wanted to include so I kind of called it the dawn of man as a bit of a joke <laughs> that it kind of went all the way back to you know when you're doing any kind of research it's like where is the boundary of where you stop sort of oh, yeah and it's like you can just keep going and going and going and tracing things back and back and back to the dawn of man so it was a bit of a joke about that and then a few years ago, I also did this thing for, uh, might have been The Quietus, actually, which was um, 13 albums that I liked. Oh, yeah. So for this, I thought I really want to choose three different al- three different things that I didn't include in that. And I was trying to think of things that I thought that were really good, but perhaps had been sort of ignored or not... not I mean, I'm, I guess they are all quite well known, but... Um, you know, for example, alternative TV doesn't really get talked about as much as Throbbing Gristle or Unique 3 don't get talked about as much as LFO, for example. Mm. Uh, so it was kind of like things that I thought were really good but sort of didn't get the attention that 
that I thought they should do. Yeah, well, I appreciated it because there were certainly two out of three records that I'd never heard before. And Which ones had you not heard? I'd heard African Head Charge. Yeah. I hadn't right, heard the okay. other two, but mm-hmm. they were absolute treats, so... You know, I'm enjoying yeah. already digging into them. But um, good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you'd like to pick the first one, I'll let you pick the ordering, and then just tell me a little Crikey. bit about you know why it's important to you as well. Well, I guess we could start with uh, well, let's start with the African Head Charge one. Okay. Which I've not got a copy of anymore because my older brother borrowed it and lost it. No. In fact, he lost all that period of on-new sound stuff he borrowed for a party. And being the stoner that he is, <laughs> lost the whole lot of them. Oh, no. <laughs> so so uh, I just actually bought it again on Bandcamp this afternoon just to remind myself what it was. But that, that I mean, that period was interesting. 80, I think 85, 86 was interesting because for me it was just... I mean, my back. The, the music I've always liked has been dance music, basically, um, and kind of what is called electronic dance music, which is a horrible title, but I guess it describes it. Yeah. Um, and and in that period, it was kind of just before house and techno and acid house sort of entered my world, if you know what I mean. And so there were things like electro, and there were things like high energy and stuff like that. And Adrian Sherwood was doing projects with Mark Stewart and the Mafia and uh, this group Tackhead that you probably heard of yeah that were that were massively important and there was Keith LeBlanc's major malfunction album and and at that time I was kind of like part of this I mean I guess I would say I was as, as living as a kind of anarchist basically with a bunch of uh, hippies and uh, people listening to a lot of dub reggae and getting really stoned. I I should explain, by the way. I, I'm not. I never actually took any drugs ever. I'm not a. So I was kind of in a bit of a weird position because I was in this community of people who got incredibly hammered the whole time, but I was always the one that was completely straight. If you know what I mean. Yeah. So I kind of listened to a lot of dub, a lot of dub music, and this particular album by African Head Charge kind of stuck out as something a little bit different in terms of the kind of music the structure of the music and the production techniques and stuff almost as if it was kind of building a bridge towards something like more like kind of dance music that you'd find in a club like a disco for example like some of the tracks for example are a little bit faster in terms of bpm than traditional dub mm-hmm. productions would be um so yeah i mean I don't. I just think it's a brilliant record. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> like, there's some tracks now. Like, like literally, I've not listened to it for about ten years. Um, I mean, I've listened. You know, I skip through on YouTube sometimes just to out of interest, but I've not properly listened for a long time. And um, there's some brilliant tracks on there. I've got a list actually. I've made some notes. <laughs> <laughs> so there's one called "Throw It Away," which I think is a really I remember at the time just thinking how amazing that was, and it is. I think it's about 100, maybe about 100 BPM, 95 BPM, something like that. Mm. So it's a little bit faster than than regular dub music. And also, Adrian Sherwood at that time was totally brilliant, and I, yeah, I just buy everything that he did basically. Yeah, I was going to say it sounded like from what I've read that he played quite an important part in your listening at that time. Yeah, but not just for me. I think for like. Most people of my generation kind of went through that period of like the later end of industrial music and on you sound kind of come in around 84, 85 ish. And, um, you know, it stuck out as something that was that was really, really, really good. And um, I think I first encountered that music. There was a little record shop in Sheffield called shock records which was opposite from warp records actually warp records hadn't opened at that time uh, this is probably about 85 and and he said i went i used to go in there every saturday with my spending money and uh <laughs> he said there's this group tackhead you should have a listen and i was like oh my god this is absolute the first two tackhead 12 inches i just thought were completely amazing um and bought them and then that opened the world of on new sound i guess yeah when i was reading that Dawn of Man article, I saw you mention Fats Comet as well, who 
I, yeah. I hadn't heard, but um, my partner walked in and I put my headphones down and it was spilling out and she just kind of backed away. It was, <laughs> it was quite an intense thing to hear just the shrill frequencies of. Yeah, well, the thing is with Fats Comet, that was a fictitious person, I think. Mm. That they kind of, I don't know exactly what the story is, but what I remember of the time, that it was a kind of fictitious person and that they were remixes of Mark Stewart and the Mafia. So uh, I think the Fats Comet one that is on that list might have been DJ's Dream. Yeah. Which was a remix of Hypnotised by Mark Stewart and the Mafia. So, for me, there was a kind of interesting... I liked it because the music was really good. But there was an interesting kind of relationship that they'd constructed between this very kind of deconstructed, chaotic kind of music that was on the Mark Stewart and the Mafia album. The track Hypnotised, it's all about surveillance and police and... uh, you know, we're living in a pretty bad situation mm. <laughs> politically. And then DJ's Dream, which was a kind of remix of that that was, you could say, is probably more polished and um, certainly more listenable in terms of, you know, it's not lots of deconstructed kind of patterns and very, there's not, not massively processed in terms of effects and things. But But the kind of lyrics on DJ's dream was like everybody wants to be a DJ and then there's this I don't know what it is but it's like some clip of some uh, sitcom or something in Britain like maybe it's something like Porridge do you know the one where yes there's like some quite unpleasant police officers and it's a bit of a kind of polite comedy about inmates and policemen and stuff and yeah. prison guards and it's something like that and so it's kind of like clearly the themes that they're dealing with in both those versions of this thing are related but one is this kind of quite intensely political and uh deconstructed thing and the other is this kind of quite slick thing you know just even the difference between dream and hypnotized for example so um for me at that time that kind of attempt to have that sort of to instigate that kind of relationship was quite interesting i think just the kind of way they brought those two things together in a kind of quite conceptual way i think yeah i think there's also something quite brash about how those kind of elements jut out of music around this time i mean listening Mm. to that african head charge album some of the sampling and some of the more i guess non-musical in a traditional Mm. sense aspects of the sampling really jut out in a big way like those dog barks i was like what is going on here but yeah in a way that feels very much of its of its time just very fearless in the way that these things are just allowed to protrude yeah and i guess there was a kind of overtly political message to it as well i mean i think Adrian Show would have done a project with Keith LeBlanc. I think it was called The Enemy Within, which was a 12-inch, which I think was about the minor strike or something, you know, the year before. Mm. So, you know, for me listening to this, it, I was also aware that I was listening to someone who politically kind of shared my, you know, shared some of my concerns and m- my kind of political outlook. And I guess although that shouldn't matter, it sort of did, if you know what I mean. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it It sounds like the, reading that Dawn of Man article again, that context that was present at that time was particularly pertinent for yourself. I mean, I have to say it's mm-hmm. before my time, so I don't know how, mm-hmm. to, to which extent, you know, that was the case for people around that time. But it, it certainly seems that it's something that you associate with that period of listening. Yeah, I mean, the the 1980s, so I was a kind of teenager in the 1980s, and I remember it being a really dark, horrible time, you know, it was like, um, you would just get beat up for having a weird haircut, you know, there was no kind of, uh, it was intensely racist, sexist, homophobic, Britain was a, a bad place to be, I think, then. Mm. And, uh, you know, you got a woman in charge of the country saying things There's no like there's no such thing as society, for example, which is quite extreme. Uh, so, you know, it was like, you, you know, you see these documentaries about the birth of house music mm. and how it was a reaction to this, uh, all these people coming together in reaction to this horribly repressive and uh, sort of right-wing political agenda. And, you, you know... 
your kind of instinct is that that might be sort of like overemphasized but actually my memory is that is exactly what it was like <laughs> it was like we were all really really sick of this bullshit and everyone had just had enough and no one had jobs and no one had money and we just everyone just parted for about four years and everyone took an insane amount of drugs and i think it was like a, a kind of uh what a person might go through if they're in a really bad place to have been in a better place. It was almost like collectively as a society, that was what was happening. You know, we were responding to the the negativity, the political kind of conservatism at, at that time. And I actually think out of that, I think that time did actually change wider public values. Uh, towards, you know, gender and identity and and uh, cultural difference and stuff. I think it did, it did make a big change. Do you mean in terms of the kind of culture that was coming out of that time? Yeah, I mean, th- towards the end of that period, like if you think around 91, 92, all these kind of super normal people who might have been the people that were once beating you up for having a weird hairdo, all these kind of laddish type of people were all getting into this culture and behaving in a way that was not about getting drunk and beating people up. Mm. And, uh, yeah, so I think the kind of massive amounts of ecstasy that those people did probably did them some good. I don't actually, I'm not actually <laughs> advocating drug use at all. I think if you could get, I think if doctors were are allowed to prescribe or or if there was a way of getting safe a supply of drugs that was safe, you know, and you knew it wasn't contaminated with some terrible substance. And I think it would be a good thing to do that, by the way. I think if you could control it and make sure it was safe, I think it would certainly be a lot less harmful than alcohol and cigarettes. Oh, totally. And, you know, there is that whole discussion of the banner of drugs being some great unwieldy and very uncompromising thing that doesn't give any space for the nuance of actually you know medically proven benefits for some of it but um, you know <laughs> well yeah i mean um like i say i don't i don't really i mean I, i've never taken any drug ever but most of my friends have taken every drug you could imagine hmm. and uh i think it is a terrible situation that they're forced to hang around with uh organized criminals hmm in order to do some recreational thing that is probably no more dangerous than skydiving or something. You mentioned actually that your friends were, or people you knew were taking drugs as a means of, I guess, going to some better place at a time which was perhaps in reality quite dismal. What mm. what were your routes for getting to that place if that was also your way of well, dealing with it? <laughs> it sounds kind of corny, but uh, for me it was music and electronic music and yeah. I was just uh, I kind of first encountered a synthesizer uh, there's a really funny story about the first synthesizer I ever used uh, I was probably about 12 or 13 and I went to my my uncle's house uh, for some Christmas get together uh, somewhere on some council estate in Sheffield and my older cousin had got a Moog synthesizer in the coal shed <laughs> <laughs> So it is like a total kind of uh, northern sort of cliche, but the first synthesizer I used was in my uncle's coal shed, and and I was like totally bored at this Christmas get together, and and someone said go and use your cousin's synthesizer, and I think I was in there for about about four hours, and it was like there was no turning back. It was just okay. This is completely. This is an amazing thing. Wow. And that was it. Yeah. That was, so you have a. <laughs> like an origin story <laughs> <laughs> yeah wow. I guess you could call it that that's amazing I saw actually um, to come up to recent times that there was an event last year I think that you you cre- uh, curated that mm. I think Adrian played at is that right yeah that was in Moscow mm. and it was called the Geom- Geometry of Now is that the thing yes you're talking about yeah yeah the lineup looked amazing but, it was amazing. Yeah. The way that happened was that these two, uh, these these two women, uh, Greta and Victoria, who worked for this founda- foundation called VAC, 
got in touch and said we're doing this sound art thing in Moscow do you want to meet and I thought they just wanted to me to do an installation or something so I was like yeah I, I can meet you for like five minutes in King's Cross <laughs> when I'm transferring <laughs> so they came out and met me and we had a, we were drinking it you know we, we met in the cafe there and uh they started talking and I was like, hang on a minute, are you asking me to curate this? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we want you to curate it. And I went, well, I'll do it if it can be the best thing that has ever happened <laughs> in, in the world that I belong to. You know, like, I want it to be the best thing ever. And they're like, that's exactly what we want to do. Uh, and it, it was like a year, it basically took a year to, to bring it together. And they did a tremendous job, you know, the production uh, that they brought to it, you know, the the, the team that they collected and uh, under their kind of leadership sort of was was amazing. Oh, great. Um, and it was a brilliant project, yeah. Yeah, and it worked out well, the the um, festival the, or the programme itself? Everything. Yeah, I mean, um, there was a lot of things that concerned me. For example, it's in a foreign country. It's in a building that isn't a venue. You know, it's a derelict power station. Mm. Well, not derelict, but vacant power station. It's minus 25 degrees. Um, uh, and there were all these things that were like, this is potentially a nightmare. But um, it actually all went really smoothly. And uh, just everything that... Like, the audiences were big, and they were all really good audiences. All the artists did really great shows. There were no weird production issues. And it got to Sunday. So the events ran until, like, 6 a.m. every night, or every morning. It got to Sunday morning, I think it was, like, 6 a.m., and I just thought, wow, we've done it. It's <laughs> We've finished, wow. and nothing's gone wrong. And uh, it was just, like, a super brilliant vibe the whole time, and... and uh, just a, a really amazing collection of musicians and artists and stuff. So it was, it was, it was like a really amazing thing to be part of. And I'm so glad they asked me to curate it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I'm, I'm not really the obvious choice. Um, like, uh, I do do quite good, good stuff, but you know, there's, a, a, I'm not really the safest choice, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Why, why'd you say that? Well, um, I think it was quite a, a, this is going to sound, I don't want this to sound arrogant or anything, but it was like quite a, a they kind of went under the radar a little bit, I think, to kind of, to find me. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm not some kind of uh, superstar art curator. I see what you mean, right. Uh, yeah. You know, so they, they could have gone for that. I don't want to mention any names, <laughs> but they could have gone for that, but they didn't. They went for me, and so it was like... Uh, I'm just really pleased that they they took that risk. And did you get to spend any time with Adrian at all? Yeah, it, I mean, it's the first time I met him. I actually, I played in Milan uh, the year before, and he played as well, and uh, I'd never met him. And he was having breakfast at the same hotel as me, but I was, like, too nervous to go over and say hello. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, when, when he came to Moscow, we um, I managed to... Uh, say hello and explain that I thought it was amazing <laughs> <laughs> fair play that's a difficult thing to relay to someone I think isn't it when they're you know that crucial to your own sort of musical yeah development. I mean I don't really do hero worship like there are a lot of people that whose music has been really important to me that I'm not really bothered about what they do now, sort of. Mm. Um, so I'm kind of more interested. I mean, it, it's nice to meet those people, but I'm so, I'm sort of like I would never curate something and put someone on just because thirty years ago they were quite interesting. Yes. Um, you know, I, I just wouldn't ever do that. Um, but it was nice to put Adrian on because I think his work's still. You know, he's still doing. It. I mean, actually, he played a lot of old stuff, and it was really good. But um, yeah, it was it was good to meet him. But it was only brief, like a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you.
let's talk about your second record now, Mark. I'll again let you pick which one you want to talk about, and uh, if you could just tell me a bit about why it's important too. Uh, I guess shall we do the alternative TV one, vibing up the senile man part one? Sure. I mean, I, what I should explain is that most of the records at this period, uh, most of the records I was buying came out of the ten pence bin in the local record shop. So it would be, you know, there was a shop, I think, that used to get stuff because it was one of these places that could feed into the charts, you know, so they had a machine that said we've sold many of this, this many of this, this week or whatever. Mm. So they'd end up with a lot of stuff in in this rack that was just 10 pence and um, actually that's where I bought most of my records because it meant I could buy more. And that's where I discovered or learned about a lot of music from the from the reject sort of ten pence bin, and this is that's where I got vibing up the senile man. There's something weird about this record because ATV, so it's not really a. It, it, this is before my time, you know. So I, I was, I was, li- I mean, I was kind of listening to music, but I'd not. It wasn't. It hadn't become the thing that was kind of the defining sort of uh, ingredient in. in in my life, if you know what I mean. <laughs> it was before the synthesizer in the coal shed moment. <laughs> um, so I kind of bought this, and it must have been already three years old or something when I bought it. So it's kind of ATV, uh, a kind of punk rock group, essentially. And the record before this, if you listen to it, is kind of like, you know, sort of quite traditional punk music. Mm. And this record is kind of like this weird mix of like avant-garde improv sound art stuff performance type things and um i think there's just some brilliant tracks on there there's one track called the radio story which um, i I tend when i was listening to this time when i'd play a record it would be i would usually just have one or two and then skip all the others if you know what i mean Hmm. so the piece on this that i really know really well is the radio story which i listen to lots but actually going back to it now and uh, listening to the other stuff, it's all really, really... I, it's probably... All of it's really good. And I probably didn't... The stuff that I didn't play at the time was probably the more weird sort of drawn out, drawn out kind of abstract things. But listening back now, they're actually really good, I think. Um, but I don't really know what more to say about it. Have you got any thoughts about <laughs> it? <laughs> well, from what I've read about it, it makes sense that you found it in the rejects bin because it sounds like it got totally and utterly panned and actually quite vehemently despised by you know critics and also audience members i mean apparently there was like a really violent stage invasion which they then all right added into like a track on an ep they released after that but yeah, it mm. sounded like people really, really reacted quite strongly to... Well, I've, I've read a lot of things that where people have said, you know, ironically, the people who were reacting strongly to this and pushing back against it were probably the very people who adopted punk and, mm-hmm. you know, found allegiance in something that was being pushed back by the more mainstream audience. So mm-hmm. they were sort but of I... punking punk by the sounds of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess for me as well, I was I was aware of punk, you know, I, I was a kid at that time, so my older brother might have gone to those sort of shows, so I knew what it was, but all that kind of swearing and spitting and jumping around and punching each other, and it was like not a world that I liked at all, you know, it was like, um, and it always seemed to me like it had all these kind of like, it was all about sort of foregrounding out out of control these people were but I know at my school it was all the kind of polite middle class people that were in (laughs) that that kind of movement you know it was like um, not that there were many polite middle class people at our school (laughs) uh, and also it, it kind of became an excuse for just being really violent and I think just really kind of horrible guy guy type behaviors you know just beating people up and just it became a kind of uh, something that it wasn't meant to be, basically. But if I look back at that stuff now, it all—I mean, I just don't get it—and it all just seems like these kind of gestures of resistance. But 
ultimately it's just all this commercial the commercialization of it i guess mm. so um yeah like it doesn't surprise me to hear that that this that this album and this period of atv were didn't do so well because um you know it's not that kind of energetic sort of bounce around and thrash your guitar and act like lads sort of no. um you know it's quite introspective and but it's really sophisticated in terms of the structure of how sounds are fitting together and things i think it's really well made so uh yeah <laughs> yeah totally well i wonder if that's got something to do with the fact that it sounded like that they were all playing instruments that they hadn't played before um so, so on, I guess on this one or the previous one on on this one vibing up the scene on man yeah i mean let's have a look at the sleeve i mean I, I yeah it's not like they were kind of bothered about kind of the level of skill that went into the performance i think <laughs> it's more about the combinations of sounds like listening back to it now it doesn't sound like it's the kind of thing that's particularly hard to play mm. but what is good is how they've combine things and also I think like uh, again it's really hard to define this but just how they've they've listened to things and let things just go on for a little bit Mm. without feeling the pressure to sort of change stuff Um, does that make sense? No totally (laughs) I think I guess as well that goes hand in hand with technical ineptitude if you find something that sounds good and that you really want to mine it's kind of like well mm-hmm. i can't play this instrument i don't understand what happens when i go up the fretboard or hit another key mm-hmm. best just drill down into this and really you know yeah. unravel it over eight minutes which works great i mean there's one mm-hmm. track i think it's like the second track maybe the first it's just got this bass hook which is like two notes played a semitone apart so they just wobble a bit and that's mm-hmm. like the whole basis of the track Mm-hmm. which is great it's so it's almost juvenile like how simple it is but it's really effective is it the second one serpentine gallery maybe Might be, i yeah. wasn't looking at the track titles when i was listening but that stuck out mm. for me in particular mm-hmm. yeah i think it's brilliant but i also think when you come to an instrument and you don't know you've not been taught how to use it you can actually do things with it that that are quite quite new i think yeah. like like if you think about the violin for example it has a particular use in in western classical music but when i went to in i've been to india a few times to learn about uh indian classical music if you look at how the violin was adopted by in the southern indian tradition they actually do things that are totally different with it mm. because they're not stuck with all that kind of historical language i guess and i think maybe that is true of of this record and you know lots of things but i also think that in some cases when you get better at what you do the actual the music gets worse yes <laughs> <laughs> there's actually loads of people i'm really tempted to name names but i'm not going <laughs> to name any names um but there's a, there's like people from you know from the early to mid 80s from the you know even recently and it's like as they've learned more about the craft of what they're doing more about the tools and they become better at using the tools it's like the music uh sort of gets worse and worse and worse Mm. um so i don't think that's the case with this record i wish i could name names but (coughs) i don't want to all right (laughs) maybe when the after recording when the red lights off yeah it's you just you know off. i turn up at festivals and these people are often there <laughs> and usually they're friends of mine actually the, it's yeah i'll leave it at that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. not super close friends usually my super close friends i really respect what they do yeah yeah <laughs> God, I'm, on just the like, I'm just making it worse and worse and worse. <laughs> <laughs> there are people now trying to plot this together. Um, I Well, I think people who know me will know what who I'm talking about. That's for you guys then. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, one thing I saw you, you mention in an interview actually was, um, and I don't know if this is still the case, but that you had an interest in what was considered acceptable in music. 
um, you know, what you could do and what you couldn't. Is that something that you recall saying? Have I? I can't recall saying that? it. Oh, what, really? What, what did I say? <laughs> it looked like. I mean, it could be that I, I misread it, but um, it kind of invalidates my question, I guess. If um, well, what's your question? My question was whether that links into your interest in this kind of music, which I guess played with unacceptability quite deliberately. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I would define what I do as essentially oppositional in terms of like when when I kind of started to make music when I was a kid at school I, I got a drum machine uh, a little boss DR55 I think it was I got it second hand for like 30 pounds and it really I think actually I think I know what you're talking about now yeah the, the drum and, machine story came up as well yeah, so what what I realised was that making music on a drum machine really upset the people who were the, the kind of punk crowd mm. at school because it was it wasn't like this kind of uh, really sort of, sort of kind of splurgy outburst of energy uh, and it kind of lacked a sort of authenticity if you know what I mean or um, yeah there was something they didn't like about it and also the kind of the the, the kind of nerdy kids who were doing music. Uh, and studying music didn't like it either and for me that that added massively to my interest in this particular kind of music because it really pissed people off because they thought it was so shit (laughs) or lacking some kind of authenticity you know the fact that they didn't like it meant that I liked it even more and I think that kind of uh, I'm not really like that these days but that kind of principle sort of stuck with me i think for at least 20 years uh where it where the, their displeasure was my kind of pleasure if you know what i mean yeah which i guess is quite a crude kind of uh tribal sort of dynamic but uh, you know i have to acknowledge that that was the case so yeah i think even now what i try to do is uh not really about being new or or anything, but it's about not... Um, this is a really difficult question. It's kind of like about uh, about not falling into any particular category, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, that's what I try to do. Totally. I, I think, I mean, to relay my experience when I saw you, which was Bexhill on Sea, actually, that was mm. a surreal day very strange yeah. like going out to see someone like you and then foraging for chips on a really windy seafront it's very there's strange. really good fish and chips at bexhill on sea yeah well they were brilliant um, yeah definitely one of my highlights but <laughs> seeing you i mean for, for me it's the feeling baited by my expectation of what's going to happen next and i think that's mm. quite nice and that's the kind of experience that i come to desire as a music listener is not being able to pave the path myself of expectation as to what's going to happen next and yeah. you know feel disarmed in that sense yeah and also it all becomes like so kind of you know you go to a classical music concert and there's all these kind of habits and platitudes and all these kind of things that go with it that you just think why can't you just get rid of all that like i went to see something in sheffield uh a few months ago and it was some uh it was a string quartet and now everyone who who was in Sheffield will probably be able to know what that was and I'm about to say horrible things about them (laughs) but but it's just like they would it was just steeped in this all this kind of gestural kind of rhetoric of everyone moving their heads and oh it was just like for god's sake why are you doing all this nonsense just (laughs) just make you know just just do what you meant to do and just and uh stop turning it into this kind of horrible sort of ritualistic kind of thing about you know what i mean totally. it was all it, it was kind of like a, a, about performing ideas of class basically yes and you know these these the people associated with, with the class for a long time i hated anything to do with classical music and and thought all of it was terrible and and that isn't the case you know but i think I'm really serious now about the the barriers 
that prevent people from listening to different kinds of music should be kind of challenged. Mm. And um, I, I just thought it was a, this, this, like, why complain about you don't get working class kids into this environment when the environment is all about performing ideas of being middle class? Yeah, you know what I mean? yeah absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I think of... I went to go see think some performances of some Penderecki pieces which mm -hmm. were like really intense and I think really speak to sonic sensibilities which exist beyond like the realm of just liking classical music mm -hmm. uh, there's so much intensity and, and dissonance in there that I think you can attack that music from so many angles and like you say at the you know dissolution of any origination in class you, you, loads of people mm -hmm. can like that stuff but yeah. At the end of each piece, they people clapped, and then the conductor went off, and then he came back on mm. again to bow again. But <laughs> there were like four pieces. I was like, why are we yeah, doing yeah. this encore applause four times? Yeah, yeah. And it felt like something that was almost like an obligation to some institutional tradition, which yeah. was a real letdown after you were like, this music still feels so pertinent and fresh <laughs> and then the big bouquet comes out yeah yeah but i've been to concerts where it's been a kind of recital of some kind of contemporary classical stuff and there's about three people in the audience and about eight people on stage and at the end of it they all do this thing where they all hug each other and bow and all clap each other like the, the performers <laughs> clap each other and it's like this is stupid there's only three people in the bloody audience yeah. like and you think you've just done the best thing i mean not that the audience size makes a difference but it's like what is this stupid ritual that you're all yes. replaying <laughs> Uh, but you know, in house music, the same's true. You, you get DJs on stage doing all these stupid gestures, and isn't it brilliant? And aren't we having this amazing time and stuff? And you know, that's equally as annoying, I think. Like there was the boiler room in Sheffield recently, and and it just becomes like this kind of uh, again, just some kind of theatrical sort of role play, play of like what it means to be in a nightclub. Hmm. Yeah. And. Um, yeah. There goes my next boiler room experience. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I know what you mean. I've seen you talk about as well the fact that um, trying to goad people into having a good time by showing that you're having a good time rather than... Yeah, I mean, I'm not usually having a good time when I'm on stage. I'm, I'm doing a job, right. you know, and it beats doing other kinds of jobs. But, like, I played in Berlin a couple of weeks ago and this, this young promoter guy who was brilliant they did they did a great job of organizing everything and uh it it was really good to kind of work with them but he, he asked me am i still excited about going and performing music and i was never excited about going and performing music <laughs> <laughs> it was always you know i like traveling i like meeting people i like hanging out and going for food and chatting and uh talking about music going on stage and doing and performing it I mean, I can sometimes enjoy it. You know, if the sound quality is good, then I will enjoy it. But I'm never excited. I've never felt excitement about getting on a stage and uh, the anticipation of getting on a stage and doing what I'm about to do. Um, because it's, you know, I'm, I'm concentrating on what I'm about to do and making sure it all works and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, this idea that, the, that you're kind of excited is just... Yeah, I, I, I don't really get it. <laughs> is there like a, a retrospective enjoyment for you where it's like, okay, that's all done now and it went well and actually that yeah, was good? Yeah, I mean, if the sound is good yeah, and I can hear it, then I will enjoy it um, because that's what I enjoy doing is like making electronic music and listening to it at decent levels over a decent sound system and it's you know it's it's good but you know i can have that feeling in my studio as well um yeah so it's not like it's without enjoyment and it certainly beats working in any kind of regular job which i, I couldn't i have done those kinds of jobs and i don't have to do it ever again it looks like so that's good <laughs> <laughs> congrats <Yeah. laughs> Trying to get... Sexy! Some noise 
Well, we should talk about your third and final record, Mark, if you want to tell me the name of it and why it's important to you as well. So the third and final one is called Just Unique, J-U-S apostrophe Unique by Unique 3, who, and it's, I think it's from like 89 or 90. 1990. So, yeah, so it's kind of around the time of the beginning of Warp Records when you had things like Forge Masters and LFO and that kind of stuff, and this group was sort of involved in that scene, but they were from Bradford, which is... Uh, I don't know of anything else that came from Bradford like this. Right. Uh, Bradford's sort of like north of Sheffield and west of Leeds, sort of. Um, and my agent's from Bradford, and I once made the mistake of saying that Unique 3 were from Leeds, <laughs> and she really just, you know, went for me. <laughs> but um, this record was absolutely brilliant, and there's a couple of tracks. The, there's the third track is so it's like two. It's two pieces of vinyl, so four sides. And the third track on side one is called Pattern Twelve, which I think is absolutely brilliant. Um, and just the combination again, just the combination of sounds is the thing that I like about it. Generally speaking, Unique Three were sort of like. A kind of techno thing with a lot of sort of bleepy kind of content but I think they did a really good job of it I think of all that stuff this is probably my favourite stuff and it wasn't actually on Warp it was on is it 10 records yeah 10 so it's you know it's kind of a little bit a tangential sort of but um, the really famous one was called Theme yeah which you might have heard of but um, what's really weird about or interesting about this record is that um, occasionally you get a track a track that's like not at all like kind of bleepy techno. You know, it's kind of a bit like there's a bit of a rap on it and it's a bit slower tempo and stuff. Mm. And um, I realise what's common with all these three records is that I wouldn't play them all the way through. I'd, I'd just kind of pick out specific uh, pieces to listen to. Because, like, I, I can't remember which one, but, like... Yeah, there's there's one called Music Music on here. I'm just going to play it just... Yeah, and it, it just sounds like, to me, like, um, you know, a completely different world. But, you know, th- it was part of this guy's, these guys' musical interests, I guess, and it's on there. But, yeah, it was like, oh, my God, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I checked my music player because mm. I was playing it on Spotify, I think. And I was like, has it just jumped to someone else? But mm. it happened a few times throughout that record. Like, it flits into yeah. hip-hop. Yeah, yeah. It leaves it all behind. Like, all the house stuff, it's really weird. It is quite a str- and But you know what? At this time, it's kind of like those worlds... I mean, they were different, but, you know, you'd go out and occasionally that kind of thing would come on mm. in the middle of that kind of set, you know, or you'd be around at someone's house listening to techno and there'd be, like, then a track with some, like, rapper or whatever would be on there. Yeah. And it was always, like... Uh, uh, yeah, and it kind of got left behind. and uh, But, yeah, at, this, at that point, I think all these kind of traditions were a little bit more closely aligned, sort of, if you know what I mean. Yeah. No, that's an interesting point. I guess you don't usually hear a band absorbing and presenting all of that in one go, mm. huh? That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, Pattern, did you say it was called Pattern 12, the third track? Pattern 12, yeah. Was that the one that's like seven minutes? Uh, it's... Um... Oh, God. No, I don't think... It... Oh, hang on. Yeah, five minutes... Nine seconds. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'd, instead of actually listening to them off vinyl, I bought them all off Bandcamp this afternoon. <laughs> so I could just check them out again on, uh, on iTunes. Well, it's proof but, worth um, doing. Uh, uh, but yeah, Pattern 12. Like, I think there's a kind of secret, a kind of little electronic synthesizer sound in there. And it's a few different layers that are kind of triggered together, it seems, mm. to create this kind of... Uh, like, like what I know now is that if you were to look at it on a kind of spectral plot, it would be quite 
the, the, the frequency content will be quite distributed, you know, so it's kind of quite a, a wide band frequency thing. Mm. Which is different to a lot of the bleepy stuff because, you know, a lot of it was just quite resonant frequencies in one particular uh, part of the sound spectrum. Yeah. Um, Although I guess I mean it. What I mean, you know what? I, maybe I'm wrong about that because people say it was sine waves, but I actually remember a lot of that stuff was probably like square waves as well. You know, which has got kind of a harmonic distribution beyond just the fund. Oh my god, I'm going a bit <laughs> nerdy, but <laughs> <laughs> well, the, I, I mean, the rhythm work on this album jumps out at me quite a lot, and I don't know whether that's because of the patterns themselves, but I guess if you do have quite a lot of frequency distribution perhaps i'm stepping mm. beyond my depth here then but it allows a certain clarity i guess to certain elements yeah i like mean that structurally room. the the way all the again the way the ingredients fit together i think is just uh totally brilliant you know they, they leave space in there and that is something that works really well for me in clubs is when the track hasn't got lots of ingredients that that work against each other but they're all in their own kind of frequency or time space if you see what I mean and I think that's something that this period of producers you know associated with this kind of northern bleepy techno stuff they all seem to get that you know LFO or Rob Gordon or Winston Hazel all seem to get this idea of giving things their own sort of space Mm. um, because it just sounds so good in in clubs i think but also a lot of these guys i know winston for example grew up on kind of dub sound systems and you know when that's your kind of background you kind of have an understanding of how sound behaves that's quite different to uh if you're going out listening to gigs and bands playing over quite grotty speaker systems right yeah you know you know in the kind of sound system world it is about uh a physical experience of sound and uh, about detail as well in, in in electronic sound i think you mentioned about this period um for which this is all taking place i mean going back to that dawn of man playlist you put together this a track from unique three appeared i think in a section where you were talking about um time at university yeah so at that time between 89 and 92 I was at art college studying experimental film and it was in Sheffield and it was this uh so it was it was called Sheffield City Polytechnic and there was this the art school bit was called Salter Lane and it was kind of like quite a infamous place to be I mean they've shut, shut it down now but it was it was basically where all the kind of creative students went you know the kind of Film and, and uh, video people, the performance people, all the fine art types, they all kind of ended up there. Mm. And so, yeah, that was really connected with the with the club scene, I think. And a lot, you know, the, so a lot of events would go on at Salter Lane. And um, yeah, it was it was really much quite a big part of the, the stuff that was going on in the city centre clubs was connected with the students at Salter Lane, I think. And yeah, like the hum- you know, the Human League did their first ever show at Salt Lane, I think. Right. Well, they did. Um, and so yeah, it was it was a, for me it was a brilliant time because it was like I'm at this art school and I'm really. It was, I mean, actually, I kind of got a little bit in the second year, got a little bit sort of lost and wasn't particularly happy with what I was doing. But you know, it was it was a great course to be on, and there was lots of brilliant students and. You know, and the city centre was erupting with all this techno stuff, so it, it was an interesting time. But but again, it was like I was, I'd go to all these things, but I'd generally be kind of stood watching what was going on and kind of soaking it up from the the edge, if you see what I mean. But yeah, it was it was a good time for Sheffield, I think. Then yeah, I was going to ask about that experience of kind of soaking it up from the edge because you are. I guess in terms of your state of mind, increasingly more discordant with the people that are around you as these kind of things go on, you know, into the evening. I mean, what kept you going to those kind of parties? Because I guess primarily they, they're there for those people who want to drop drugs and then <laughs> dance and stuff. So what, what was in it for you? Was it, again, was it the, the music that you wanted to listen to? Yeah, but 
but actually I remember just getting really, really, usually going and just being really, really dissatisfied towards the end with uh, what I was hearing there. And just I re my overriding memory, I mean, you know, at first I enjoyed it and it was like, yeah, this is amazing. But then it just became this thing of like, oh my God, it's like 4am and... <laughs> There's no buses till like seven and I've got to like just stand in the corner of this room like waiting and it's freezing cold and <laughs> and the toilets are horrible. You know, and I, I just, I guess I just, um, just moved away from it. And, and also I was, I'd kind of, so I'd kind of, like I said, my, I kind of discovered electronic music about 80, 283 and um, and went through this kind of synth pop thing and then discovered industrial music and and this kind of quite alternative and weird stuff and then found myself getting in when techno and house arrived it was like oh my god this is the um, this is everything I've wanted out of music has suddenly happened if you know what I mean mm. and I think for a lot of people of my kind of age group that was a kind of common feeling that this was the delivering the promise that the industrial music was kind of trying to give you know this uh, sort of tribalistic sonic uh, thing not not that industrial music was responsible for it I'm not saying that you know I'm not saying um that it came out of that scene. I'm just saying for people of that scene, mm -hmm. when it arrived, it's like, yeah, this is this is what we've really been waiting for. And it was, and it was amazing, you know, like uh, early techno and house and acid house and stuff. But I guess I just, um, for me, I remember when kind of hardcore music started to emerge and I just thought it was like the most terrible thing ever, like. <laughs> This kind of really fast breakbeat stuff, which you know, looking back now, I kind of think, wow, that's really good. <laughs> but I think, and, and what the weird thing that happened is around '91, when I became aware that there were all these kind of diverting strands. That's what it felt like to me that all these different strands were splitting up, and you know, there's this, the techno guys were going one route, the house music guys were going the other route. Around that time is when I realised there was a thing. A, a, a distinct kind of sound that was New York or, or not kind of North American house music um, and a DJ called Callum Wordsworth uh, from Sheffield who's now some resident DJ in Ibiza sort of introduced me to uh, these kind of North American deep house records and it's kind of weird that although I'd got this background in pretty radical or mental electronic music it was this kind of really purist sort of house kind of formula that really drew me in. Um, so just like kind of mellow organ sounds <laughs> and a really simple rhythm. And um, that's what I want. You know, I, I've always been kind of quite obsessive about what I listen to and tend to be quite specific about what I will and will not listen to, especially at that age. You know, it was like if something had the wrong kind of clap sound in it was like oh i'm going home now because they, they just played some fi that's got finger snaps in and i should have had a clap i think so i'm going home and it, that's the kind of <laughs> so, <laughs> so this so i kind of got increasingly into this kind of uh north american house music production and it's weird this is where you know DJ Sprinkles, Terry Temlitz, this is where we, mm. this is the thing that we've really got in common is this love of house music of this period. And um, so, yeah, that was, that's kind of about 92, that's where I was at. And it was like, I was trying to make this kind of music, but I didn't, for some reason, I just wanted to make a kind of weirder version of it and didn't really know what that would be or or what I was trying to do and it probably took me about five years after that point maybe about 96 to kind of get some sort of idea about what I wanted to do with it but yeah I think most of my early work was really looking at the structure of North American house music and and uh yeah working with that were there any means of trying to 
inject that weirdness into that music that you loved that haven't stayed with you now like oh yeah <laughs> yeah and i made so much terrible music <laughs> um trying to just work out what i wanted to do basically you know and so yeah i mean um it took me a while to just uh, uh, what what happened was that um i think about 95 so so well after this kind of house and techno sort of revolution that hit electronic music yeah around 95 i became aware of things like mike inc and thomas brinkman and uh basic channel from berlin and these were people who were doing also matthew herbert was doing some stuff that i think was quite good around then mm. which was kind of very simple linear rhythmic stuff with just nice keyboards and there wasn't much change really it was quite repetitive and that was quite important for me because it it meant that i could kind of reject these very complex sort of structure like narrative structures in music if you know what i mean uh, and just focus on patterns that looped mm. and uh just reject everything that that wasn't relevant you know so the idea of like things dropping out and building up or bass lines like like uh just being able to make music without bass lines was a really uh kind of liberating experience <laughs> that sounds so stupid but you know as a young as a young guy you you want to make house music or something and you think you have to have a bass line in there so it's like yeah we've done the keyboard bit now we have to do the bass line and it'd be like oh my god it's just not working <laughs> and you know it was for me the once i realized i could reduce things and just have two elements and work with that it actually became a much more sort of uh I ended up doing stuff that I actually liked a bit more. Right. <laughs> but yeah, I made I've got I've got so many dat tapes that will never leave my studio <laughs> of like totally crap things. Damn it. <laughs> Mark, this has been great. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk through some records and much more. Besides, it's been great to talk good, to. Good, good. I'm glad. I'm glad you thought it was all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, if people want to find out more about yourself and your music and what you've got coming up, where's the best place for them to go? Well, probably my website, which is markfell.com because uh, I don't do any kind of social media stuff so uh, of course yeah I'm getting more and more pressure to do Facebook and Twitter and things but I'm not going to do it <laughs> you're not giving way <laughs> yeah I, I think that's great um, great great well thanks once again and to everyone listening I will see you next time okay thanks bye bye